Canada's foreign policy has long navigated the narrow waters between our national interest and those of our major, more powerful allies and competitors. And now, with the rise of China and much less predictable policies coming out of the U.S. and Britain, plotting that course for Canada faces even more uncertain headwinds. With us for their perspectives, on Salt Spring Island, B.C., via Skype, there's Michael Byers, Canada Research Chair in Global Politics and International Law at the University of British Columbia. In our nation's capital, Gary Keller, Vice President at Strategy Corp and a one-time Chief of Staff to former Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird. And here in our studio, Besma Momani, Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo and a Senior Fellow at CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation. And Adam Chapnick, Professor of Defense Studies at RMC, the Royal Military College of Canada, and Deputy Director of Education at the Canadian Forces College. And it's great to have Besma, you here. This has got to be your 10th or 15th or 80th time here, I'm not sure. Adam, for the first time. Yes. Lovely to have you here. Thank you for having me. And thanks you too, and points beyond for being with us as well. Let me start with something that the current Prime Minister's father said 50 years ago during a visit to the White House. We all remember this famous statement. Living next to you, the U.S., is in some ways like sleeping with an elephant. No matter how friendly and even-tempered is the beast, if I can call it that, one is affected by every twitch and grunt. So, there is the Trump beast and now the beast of China as well that we have to talk about, stereo beasts. Gary, I'm going to start with you. Has the arrest of Meng Wanzhou at the request of the United States put Canada squarely between the proverbial rock and a hard place? Well, look, there's no doubt that the, uh, the, the arrest of, of Madame Meng uh, has certainly uh, caused a, 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 a tough situation with, the, uh, with, with China and with the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, the government has to walk a very fine line here. Um, with, uh, with, with the Meng arrest. Um, the, uh, the way forward I I is not easy for, for the government. Uh, and we've seen that with, uh, you have Christian Freeland, who has said very clearly that Canada is rule of law country. And we saw John McCallum say uh, things to the contrary of that. Uh, and for those comments, he lost his job. Yes. Those, 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 those comments got him fired. And we still don't have a full-time uh, ambassador in place. Uh, look, uh, I don't think the government of Canada had a choice but to arrest her. I, I was dismayed when I heard, uh, you know, a Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Chrétien and uh, former Minister Manley say, well, maybe some creative diplomacy should have taken place here. Uh, I, I don't think that was a, a way to solve this problem. Um, and uh, with uh, the Prime Minister uh, in, in Washington recently, uh, I think it's really important to get those uh, votes of support from senior officials in, the, in, the, uh, in Washington. Uh, when uh, Vice, uh, Vice President Pence was here, he reiterated that very strongly uh, about the need to return the two detainees, the two Michaels, if you will. And uh, as well, uh, Secretary of State Pompeo has also been very, uh, very loud and very active on that front. So, um, yes, of course, uh, international affairs is always uh, is always challenging when you have a, an evolving situation like this. But, uh, you know, I think uh, the public statements of the government of Canada have been where they needed to be. Um, and I think statements to the contrary by former officials actually help to undermine uh, the government's way forward. Michael Byers, uh, you know, uh, we've heard many I guess they're jokes. People saying, boy, couldn't they have just lost her or misplaced her or couldn't they have turned off their homing beacons or something like that for five minutes? Do you think uh, Canada in any way could have done something different to have avoided this crisis? I was in Washington a month ago talking with a uh, former uh, senior official uh, from the Obama administration. His first question to me was, why didn't your government warn her off? Why didn't you uh, let her know that she faced arrest if she were to uh, fly to Canada? Uh, be that as it may, uh, that's history now. We're in a new situation, a difficult situation. And I think the, the key point I'd like to make here is that uh, the answer to the Meng Wanzhou uh, conundrum lies in Washington and not in Beijing. The extradition request came from the United States. Um, it's uh, a valid request under the uh, Canada-U.S. extradition treaty, we have to honor it, but it could be withdrawn at any time by the U.S. government. 
Um, and uh, there are reasons to think the U.S. might consider uh, doing so. The U.S. president twice mentioned that it could be used as a negotiating card in, in trade talks with China. Uh, so instead of uh, piling on China and trying to pressure China into backing down, which it won't do because for China this is all now about face, uh, the key, I think, is to find a solution in Washington that could involve a broader negotiation between all three countries. Well, interestingly enough, Besma, uh, one former prime minister suggested that another former prime minister ought to go over there. Brian Mulroney saying Jean Chrétien has good relations with the Chinese, always has, and therefore maybe he can make something happen. Doesn't look like the current government of Canada is going to take him up on that suggestion, but what do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. You know, also, I, just to add another layer of complexity, of course, it doesn't help that you have uh, Donald Trump talking about the fact that, you know, uh, maybe some deal could be worked out, suggesting that somehow the rule of law doesn't apply here. I mean, we're in a tough spot. There, there's no way around it. It, it is what it is. Uh, I think it's too late, frankly, to bring in the elders and try and negotiate something. I mean, certainly something very early on, where indeed we might have you know, given her forewarning, all of that might have been fine to avert where we're in. But now I think we just have to see it through. There's just no way what around it. What does that it. mean, see it through? We just have to wait till she makes her appearance uh, in in Washington and basically uh, answers the questions that are before her. I mean, there's really no other way around it because, frankly, then we're really taking a big fall in terms of this, this moral high ground that we've taken from the very beginning. Adam, get comfy because I want to set up your first question with, uh, with a bit of setup here. It's been reported that the Premier of China has refused to speak with Justin Trudeau. Christa Freeland, the Foreign Affairs Minister, has been refused communications with China's Foreign Minister. It's unlikely, apparently, that Prime Minister Trudeau is going to get any face time with Xi Jinping at the upcoming G20 meeting in Osaka later this week. So wrap it all up for us. Put a bow on it. What does this say about our diplomatic options right now? Um I think it says two things. Uh, first, it says something about the way China views Canada, which is that we aren't a really significant power. And as a result, given that they aren't going to change their mind, there's no need to humor us by granting us these meetings. It's just a reminder that we're at a different level when the, uh, according to the Chinese. Uh, for us, I think it does say that we, there is one thing we can do, and it's remind all the other Western liberal democracies out there who are at the same level in China's eyes as we are that this could also happen to them. Who would that be? Um, this is our NATO allies. This is our Five Eyes partners. These are our EU uh, associates. Just remind them that they should be objecting to the treatment of Canadians because next time it might not be us who faces these things. And the Chinese have shown to be sensitive to global criticism, to hmm. criticism from multiple countries. They don't really care if Canada is upset. But when it's a group of countries, particularly they, have, they do economic business with, they're a little bit more sensitive to that. So to our allies, ease up on the schadenfreude, that kind of thing. Yeah, and, uh, and when we complain, hopefully there can be others that complain with us. We shouldn't be complaining alone. It just uh, ref reminds the world that we aren't that powerful on our own. Well, I'll pick up on that word alone, because, Gary, I'll bring you in on this. The uh, Canadian historian Robert Bothwell said, we have never been this alone. We don't have any serious allies. And I think that's another factor in what the Chinese are doing. Our means of retaliation are very few. That's Robert Bothwell's position on this. What do you say? Well, look, um, foreign policy is an evolving situation, and uh, I don't, th I don't think we are completely alone in the world. Uh, the, the the reality is, the situation has changed over the years. Uh, the size of China, the growth of China on the world stage. Um, it, it's great to advocate for other countries to speak up for us on this case, uh, as, as the case was made. Uh, the reality is, in a lot of cases, other countries look at their situation with China and say, "Oh, yeah, I mean, you make a good point, but maybe we, we for our own interests, uh, we're we're going to stay quiet on this." I thought it was indicative when um, the, uh, the the Twitter spat uh, was raised with uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, and Canada went looking for allies to speak out on its behalf. I thought that was actually actually quite shocking and surprising that a lot of what we would consider our natural allies, uh, you know, all, all of a sudden uh, they couldn't take our call or they weren't really uh, available. So Interesting. Um, Can I get look, Michael I to follow up on that, actually? My, Michael, fo follow up on that one point. Is there anybody else out there, allies of ours, as Adam says, uh, who are going to bat for us right now with the Chinese? Well, we have lots of allies who are concerned about this. Uh, look at Australia, look at New Zealand. Uh, France, Germany. Uh, there are lots of middle powers who, who share our concern. But I would also like to suggest that uh, losing the protection of a, a consistently reliable United States might actually be good for Canada, 
and that it's forcing us to think for ourselves for a change, to stand up for ourselves. Uh, it's really difficult to, to develop an independent foreign policy and to develop all the capacities that we didn't used to need. Uh, but in the long term, um, I think this could be good for Canada and Canadian foreign policy to, to relieve ourselves of our dependence on one large neighbour and to find our own uh, way in the world. Besma, Robert Bothwell also said China is a hostile power. Do you think he's right about that? You know, it's certainly, I think, not, you know, it's, let's call it a frenemy. You know, it's a friend, but it's also got adversarial undertones. I mean, you know, we have to keep in mind here that there are a lot of things that do bind us. Uh, clearly, of course, I think trade is one, you know, one, one matter, a huge diaspora community here. I mean, there's lots of things that keep us connected as well. But, you know, I think it is, it is a rising power that... Uh, seeing how it's increasingly going into surveillance technology, increasingly, uh, frankly, afraid of its image abroad, the whole consolidation that's happening uh, behind Xi inside the country are all worrying signs. I mean, there is a nationalist populist discourse, even in China, around the Communist Party that is worrying. And I think that we're going to see a, certainly a more emboldened China out there. And uh, I think, you know, Australia, as Michael pointed out, is certainly feeling that they're the one that often pay most of the price of that kind of emboldened boldness that we see in China, but I don't think we can escape it either. And we, we really have to sort of walk this very fine line. I don't think we can completely ignore the fact that we do have uh, a strong, uh, a necessary relationship with the Americans that will always hopefully back us. But, you know, of course, this is a Trump administration that is just unorthodox all the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that traditional backing us up is just not working this time around. Michael, would you associate yourself with Bob Bothwell's comments that China is now a hostile power? China is just a very different country from Canada. It has a different uh, governing system. It has a very different history. Um, I wouldn't say that it's an enemy, uh, but it's certainly a country that we have to try to understand and try to work with while being very cautious. This is not a country that we can trust. Uh, but that's not a, a, a new challenge for international diplomacy. Uh, we made it through the Cold War, uh, faced with a, a, a Soviet Union that had thousands of intercontinental ballistic missiles pointed at North America. Uh, we can get through these things. And, uh, and look, uh, even while we were uh, standing off against the Soviet Union, we were finding ways to partner with them in some things. Uh, there was a moment when uh, uh, American and, and Russian astronauts actually met in orbit and shook hands at the height of the Cold War. So, no, there's always a way forward. Uh, do you see that way forward, Adam, right now? Because it sure looks as if relations between Canada and China are the worst they've been maybe since uh, the founding of the PRC uh, 70 years ago. I think that one thing that will make this easier in the long term is that the Chinese have proven to be quite pragmatic. The moment this problem is solved for them, uh, they won't have a problem with us anymore. They'll move on to, to whatever's in their interests next. And uh, so while this is a huge problem right now, uh, the moment it's solved, I don't think it will leave the kind of residue that we sometimes have with diplomatic spats with closer allies, uh, ironically. The Chinese just don't have time for that. Hmm. To the extent that we have, as the expression goes, punched above our weight on the foreign affairs stage, uh, Let's put this forward. It's because that we have worked well with these multilateral institutions, the United Nations, NATO, various trade agreements along the way, and so on. Uh, it's a rules-based international liberal order, liberal international order, which is, I guess, what you folks call it. Um, Gary, Donald Trump has certainly done his best to uh, disrupt and upset that international order. How successful do you think he's been? Well, look, I think he's been uh, fairly successful for his own self-interest in the United States. And he's been successful in raising doubts about the future and, and, and people like our panel having these discussions about uh, what we assumed was uh, the status quo for a rules-based uh, international order. So I think he's been successful in that, in that way. But at, at the same way, uh, in, in a lot of ways, the, you know, the multilateral world still continues and still has uh, a basis, and, and there's a need for it. Now, now look, you know, some people worship at the altar of multilateralism. I'm not one of those per persons. I think that uh, multilateralism certainly can play a role, but it is not the end-all and be-all uh, of international relations or Canada's foreign policy. And as such, we have to take those and look at those multilateral relationships in a one-on-one -on -one situation. I asked the question, uh, Adam, because, of course, it, we've made or we've been able to make an outsized contribution, the argument goes, to foreign affairs because of these 
multilateral institutions being so strong and longstanding. And if they're weaker now, and, and who knows, maybe crumbling, where does that leave us? Well, I think they might be weaker now, but they're remarkably resilient. And I think the key with us is not giving up on them just because they're weaker. Uh, we benefit as a smaller country, not a military superpower, from a system of rules that we can master. We're, we're a smart country, we're well-educated. If you give us some rules, we can figure out how to maximize our interests. So we need that system to persevere. And I think the way to do that is not give up on it when it faces some challenges. We faced challenges before. Uh, Mr. Nixon shook up uh, the international monetary system. We survived that. Uh, there have been other challenges during the Cold War. It's the international security system. We've survived that. So I think the key with Canada is patience perseverance and resilience in this sort of situation. Michael Bars, where do you think we are, given the disruption to the multilateral institutions that we've always felt so comfortable dealing inside of? I think that George W. Bush did far more damage to the international rule-based system in his first term than Donald Trump has done so far. Uh, think of uh, uh, Guantanamo Bay and the use of torture. Uh, think of the invasion of Iraq based upon false assertions of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Trump hasn't done anything that serious yet. Um, the international system is very resilient. It will recover uh, from Donald Trump. Uh, the system is always changing. Um, my concern right now as a Canadian is that, that Canada isn't really leading very much in the world. Uh, we, uh, for instance, uh, did not uh, come to the assistance of the United Nations when they asked us to extend our mission in, in Mali. Uh, we uh, haven't been uh, keeping our, our firm commitments that we made initially at Paris on climate change. Uh, there are lots of different things where, where Canada seems to be drifting um, at the precise moment when there's an opportunity for, for leadership. And, uh, and, and God knows when the world is needing a middle power like Canada to, to step up and, and be that bright light. Michael, let me do a quick follow-up with you, because you say these institutions will recover from Donald Trump. <laughs> That presupposes that Trump is a blip as opposed to the new norm and what comes after him, you know, maybe even worse. You sure about the premise? Uh, all I know is that the Americans will choose uh, their own leaders uh, and that we will work with them. But when I look at uh, uh, the alternatives, I, I don't see uh, any of them being as, as unstable uh, and uh, unpredictable uh, and as uh, disinterested in international affairs. Uh, as Donald Trump. He's an aberration in many respects, even if uh, his right-wing views are, are not uh, uh, his alone uh, in the United States. Besma, what say you on this issue of how we play a role in the world if these organizations that we have played the role in are in trouble? Well, we need those organizations, and because we are a middle power, precisely because we live beside the United States. I mean, you know, the, the 2003 war in Iraq is quintessential moment where, indeed, we hung our hat on the United Nations. We said we are not going into this war unless the UN Security Council approves it. And that was really important to us. We do that in these tough situations when we're put in that proverbial, you know, uh, rock in a hard place. And we need to have these international organizations to basically protect us from being bullied by countries like the United States and others. So it's very important. Multilateralism and international organizations are very important. I don't know about them being resilient, but there's certainly inertia. But I am worried that there is uh, indeed a way, you know, an opportunity and a chance uh, for a lot of leaders, not just Trump, many of the populist nationalists that are taking over Europe to chip away at the foundation of that, including not just the EU, sorry, not just the international organizations and multilateral uh, groups like NATO and so forth, but even like the EU, which you see by the rise of nationalist populists. So it's, it's a dangerous time, this idea of uh, of, of, of multilateralism is under attack, I think, by these nationalist populist leaders. And it's really, I think, uh, problematic to the, the, the problems of our day, from climate change to, uh, you know, the managing globalization to all of the great things that are before us. They need multilateral solutions. So this is a time when we need to reinvest in those organizations. But we're seeing in reality people are pulling away from them. Well, one of these organizations that we've always cared a lot about, Adam, is actually an organization you're writing a book on, from what I understand right now, the United Nations Security Council. Got a book coming out this fall? This fall. Got a title yet? Yes, uh, it's Canada on the United Nations Security Council, a small power on a large stage. We will look for it. Should we continue to put the kinds of efforts we traditionally have in the past into being players on that council in the future? I think it's very much in our interest to have a seat on the council, just for, as one example. We're having trouble getting a hold of China right now. If we really want to speak to China, it's quite helpful to be on the UN Security Council where we bump into them 24 hours a day, every day for two years. I mean, there are some pure diplomatic benefits to a seat on the council. I'm not as 
confident that we chose the right year to run necessarily because there were already candidates in the slots and it's not necessarily in our interest to disrupt but a position on the council whether we have any leadership defect or not has diplomatic benefits in terms of our access to some of the serious powers in the world on a consistent basis that we can't get otherwise. Gary, uh, the government that you were a part of, the Harper government through Foreign Affairs Minister John Baird, uh, never really thought much about being on that council, I think, right? It wasn't as big a deal for you as it sounds like it is for Adam. Fair to say? Fair to say, and uh, there are lots of avenues for the government of Canada to make its views known. Um, you know, we decided not to pursue uh, a, uh, another attempt at a Security Council seat, largely because of the cost involved with it, uh, at a time when we were uh, trying to ensure that uh, the deficit was under control. Um, and, you know, uh, t you know, quite a lot of money is spent and, and time and effort is spent on these, uh, these efforts. And given the government's current relationship with a lot of countries around the world, there is some serious doubt whether or not Canada could win uh, a, a seat on the U UN Security Council. And, and to Adam's point, uh, I think uh, there, you know, the slots were already well set up in advance, uh, and I think the, uh, the Trudeau government made that a, a, as a, an election promise, um, and I, I'm, I'm not sure it's going to pan out a, as promised. So, um, you know, I, I think there's a, a decision has to be made. If we are going to pursue a seat on the UN Security Council, then we have to be all in and do it, and I think that was probably one of the failures in the Harper government in 2010. Uh, is that uh, due to a minority government and some other decisions, we were in, full in, we were out, we were halfway in. And uh, if you're going to win a seat in the UN Security Council, you have to be all in and committing to it. But these things cost money, they cost time, they cost energy. And uh, at the end of the day, a government has to determine whether or not it's worth that time and energy to have those seats. As, as for having a, 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 you know, a, an opportunity to talk to the Chinese ambassador, you know, there's nothing that prevents Prime Minister Trudeau from trying to do a quick pull aside with President Xi, even if, he, even if he refuses to do so, at least Prime Minister Trudeau would look from a position of strength that he actually, you know, tried to it and uh, the Chinese are being uh, petty about the discussion. Hmm. Michael, I want to ask you about blue helmets. Here we go. Here are some numbers. There are apparently 112 active Canadian peacekeepers when Justin Trudeau took office. That is down from the 370 from when Stephen Harper took office. And that is down from the 2,318 when Jean Chrétien came to office. We fancy ourselves a peacekeeping nation. It doesn't look like we're putting our money where our mouth is. Is it time to say goodbye to that idea? I don't think it's time to say goodbye to that idea. I think the, uh, the mission in Mali, although it took a long time for the Trudeau government to decide on that mission, was the right kind of mission for Canada. Uh, we have really good equipment. Uh, we have uh, soldiers who are very good at training other soldiers. We can uh, be a force multiplier in United Nations peacekeeping missions, but we need to be doing more of it. And we also need to accept uh, uh, both at a governmental level and at, at the public level that peacekeeping can be dangerous, that peacekeepers can lose their lives. Uh, that's been the issue in Mali. The, the Trudeau government doesn't want to uh, have any soldiers lost, particularly in the run up to a federal election. Uh, the other thing I need to say, and this is in defense of the Trudeau government, is that uh, when they announced they were going to run for a Security Council seat, uh, they started to make that big effort. Uh, Stefan Dion was foreign minister, everything was going well, and then Donald Trump became president of the United States, and everything shifted towards that new focus. There was a change in foreign minister. It was all hands on deck, focused at Washington. And uh, look, everyone took their eye off of the, uh, the ball of the Security Council seat. Uh, now they're starting to pay a bit more attention to it again, and I fear it's too late. I, I think we really lost uh, uh, two and a half years of, of really important time in, in that campaign and in showing leadership at the United Nations. We haven't been showing leadership because we've been obsessed uh, with Donald Trump. Hmm. Okay, per our tradition on this program, we talk mostly policy, but we do talk a little bit of politics from time to time. And given that we're only a few months away from a federal election in the fall, we probably should touch on this a bit. Best minute, you first. Are there really significant differences in policy, in approach, when it comes to foreign affairs between liberals, New Democrats, Greens, Conservatives, People's Party of Canada? How vast is the, is the chasm there? Or not? Well, I mean, compared to domestic politics, yes, the, the sort of the, the spread is certainly, I think, 
far narrower when it comes to international affairs. Uh, we tend to sort of have a very similar policy amongst all policies, generally speaking. But I think it would be, um, I think, uh, uh, simplistic to suggest that somehow they're all the same. There is, I think, some unique differences, and some of them, I think, spill over into issues that we think about as domestic affairs, from the environment, of course, is a big one. Um, immigration is another one, I think, that, you know, also how we approach and deal with other countries or even our vision of ourselves in the world affects even our relationship here with our, our, our different ethnic communities. I mean, there are, I think, spillover of international affair issues that certainly matter to us on a domestic front. But yes, I, I take the point that on international affairs, and certainly anybody who studies Canadian foreign policy will say this all the time, uh, we know that the Canadian public does not vote on that basis. That's not the reason they choose a particular party, and parties know that. And so they stick to finding differentiation amongst themselves uh, on domestic issues, certainly more so than the international. I guess, Adam, I want to know, is there is there any evidence to suggest that if a different party were in power now, or if a different party were in power come the fall, that our relations with China would somehow automatically be better, or there'd be a clearly different approach to the whole Chinese issue uh, than there is right now? I think those are two questions. Uh, at the college, we often talk about ways, ends, and means as national strategy. I think all of the parties would have the same ends in mind, uh, Canadian prosperity and security. Uh, means, they'd all spend not enough, so they'd all be the same there. Um, the ways are a little bit different. Uh, the, the value that different parties place on the diplomatic process is a little bit different, and the role of diplomacy in solving problems, the attitudes of the parties, is a little bit different. That said, even if the parties took different approaches to China, I don't think the Chinese would care very much. And I think the result, for the most part, would be the same, because we just aren't important enough to shape Chinese decisions on our own. Gary, let's acknowledge your uh, former conservative credentials on this issue. Do you, do you think there is a significant difference among the major political parties in the House of Commons today on how to approach the major issues of the day, China, Russia, United States, et cetera. So on, on the core issues of, you know, uh, Canadian, uh, pursuing Canadian interests and Canadian values like freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law, there is general, uh, a general basis of agreement. We do get into some differences in how parties suggest that they would conduct themselves. Uh, for example, obviously, uh, when Andrew Scheer went to India on a, on a uh, bilateral visit, he was very careful to conduct himself in a certain way to, to demonstrate and contrast his approach with that of, uh, of Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, however, on some issues, there are some, some, some constants. I, I'm very happy as a Canadian to know that unlike the United States, you know, if you look at the members of parliament, uh, there isn't a single member of parliament who you could point out and say, aha, that person is really pro-Russia or pro-Putin or is a shill for the, for the Russians. There's 338 MPs in the House of Commons, and there is virtual unanimity uh, with minor differences on how to deal, deal with Russia. Uh, on Iran, I think the liberals had a very different approach to Iran, and this has been borne out by some research in trying to reestablish uh, relationships uh, and uh, official relations with that country, I think you would see a uh, conservative government uh, led by Andrew Scheer taking a very strong uh, role in that regard. And uh, there will certainly be some differences in how to interact on a, on, on a daily basis, on, on you know, a weekly basis with the Trump administration that uh, between, say, conservatives and liberals. Uh, and then on the issue of Venezuela, for example, you know, you've got conservatives and liberals very sort of aligned on, on a tough stance on Venezuela, while Jagmeet Singh and the NDP seem to be way off in left field trying to, uh, trying to uh, you know, cozy up with certain people. Uh, that is really disappointing on, on that front. So, uh, like I said, some core, some core basic values where people tend to agree on, uh, but some differences in the way uh, parties uh, propose conducting themselves. Besma, you wanted a quick follow-up on that? Uh, just to say that I think that, you know, in the past few years, there's also been a personalization of politics a lot, so, you know, a lot more so than, than we're used to. And so by that, I think, you know, if there was a change in prime minister, I think you could see some of these countries from China to Russia to Saudi Arabia, in fact, sort of allow, take that as an opportunity to say, now we have a fresh new clean slate. And so that is a danger, I think, in, um, I think, uh, also what I would argue allows intervention in our in our uh, elections. I think there are some parties out there would like to see certain people win, uh, and that's something that I think we need to keep our eyes open for. That would be incentive then for others to Absolutely. influence our outcome. Okay. Michael Byers, I should ask you to weigh in on the same issue, and, and in doing so, I think I'm right about this. You were once a candidate to the NDP, were you not? 
Uh, I was uh, a decade ago uh, when the leader of the NDP was a very persuasive man named Jack Layton. <laughs> okay, um, weigh in if you would then. Uh, well, I, I just want to, to uh, essentially address the, the myth that foreign policy doesn't matter during federal elections. There are two foreign policy issues uh, centrally on the table right now. One is climate change, the other is immigration. Um, we'll see how those play out, but those are big foreign policy issues. and. And the liberals and conservatives uh, have differences on those. And then there's always the, the very real possibility that the United States could uh, use military force abroad uh, prior to the Canadian federal election. The most likely scenario now are airstrikes on Iran. Uh, where will the, uh, the different parties position themselves on that? Uh, will Andrew Scheer uh, throw his support behind Donald Trump? Will Justin Trudeau uh, hold back? Uh, it's difficult to, it's impossible to predict the future, uh, but that could be a wild card uh, in the federal election, and it would be foreign policy front and center. Is there anybody on this program tonight who thinks we're going to go to war with Iran because Donald Trump says so? If John Bolton and Mike Pompeo have their way, yes. Are they going to have their way with any government of Canada on this issue? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, will they be able to sway Donald Trump mm -hmm. is the issue. Can Bolton and Pompeo sway Donald Trump, who's very hesitant to go to war mm -hmm. with Iran? He does not want it, that's for no, sure. No, he does not. Okay. That's our time, everybody. I want to thank you all for coming on to TVO tonight. Michael Byers, Gary Keller, Besma Momani, Adam Chapnick. Adam, first time out. Did you enjoy yourself? I had a great time. Great. We enjoyed having you here. Thanks so much, everybody. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.